Hello and welcome. Hi, I'm Dave. This tutorial is part of a beginner's HTML series. I'll be using the Chrome web browser, the Visual Studio Code editor, and the live server extension for Visual Studio Code to view the web page. There are links to these tools, starter code files, and all resources in the description below. Let's look at adding images to our web page. Until now, we've only worked with text, but HTML supports multimedia and images are a big part of that. So what we wanna do is go to Visual Studio Code that I have here on the left, and I have our project running here on the right, and we're using Live Server for that. So the Live Server has launched down here and you can click to close the server or open the server. Uh, if you don't have the Live Server extension, search for that here in the extensions, find Live Server, and that should pull up by Ritwick Day and you just want to install that and it can launch your page for you. Okay, going back to what we need, we have clicked on the File Explorer in Visual Studio Code, and we need to create a folder to hold our image files. So I'll type IMG to name this folder, and it is a common practice to keep your images for your web page or web pages in a separate folder as you organize your project. Now that we've got that, I'm going to grab some images and paste those in so we can work with them. You'll be able to download these images from the files and resources that I share in the description. However, at the end of this tutorial, I'm also going to go over some resources where you can download your own images that are free for use. So now inside this image folder, I'm just going to right click and choose paste and paste these images in. And let's look at what we've got. I can click on the vacation image and I get this vacation image here. And notice at the bottom, we can see the size of the image. It's 400 by 267. Those are pixels. We can look at this HTML logo that we're going to use. It's 300 by 300. And we've got an image of the Caribbean as well. And it's 400 by 225. So I'm going to collapse this now. And we're going to use those in our HTML code. So now I'll click on the File Explorer to hide the file tree, and this all starts with the image tag. So let's scroll down in our HTML to where we want to insert our first image in our page. We're going to put it right below the paragraph that says this is my first web page in the I'm ready to learn HTML section. Okay, let's start by typing IMG and pressing tab, and then Visual Studio Code will help us with that image abbreviation, and it will automatically fill out the rest of the image element. Now notice the image element doesn't have a closing element like we see here with a heading or we see here with a paragraph. Sometimes you will see it with a slash like that at the end, which means it's self-closing. HTML does not require that, or I should say HTML5 does not require that. However, if you are using this in the future in something like React, it may require that. So that's just something to be aware of. Right now, I won't put that in because HTML5 does not require it, and that's what we're focusing on. Okay, notice the image element has a source attribute and an alt attribute automatically. The source attribute tells HTML where to grab the image we want. So we start by typing the folder name that we created. Now we see the folder here, image slash, and I can click on that, and then it provides us the names of the images that we have. Well, we want the HTML logo that I saved. So I'll just click on that, and there is the full relative path to our image. It's in the same project here, and it's on our local server in this area. So we don't need that absolute URL that would grab it from somewhere else on the web. So this is once again a relative path to our folder and then to the image. Then we have the alt attribute. Now the alt attribute has a couple of purposes. One is to help assistive technology. For those that may not be able to see the image we are putting on the page, the assistive technology like a screen reader will read the description of the image. So let's put HTML5 logo as the alt text. But this also makes this alt text appear on the page if the image for some reason does not load. So first of all, let's just save our page and you'll see the logo now appear on the web page. And suddenly our page got much more interesting. It's awesome putting images into our web pages. 
However, let's go ahead and change the file name so that it doesn't find the image and let's see what happens on the page. Now we have a broken image icon, but notice our alt text appears, HTML5 logo. So that is another purpose of the alt attribute. I'll fix that so we get our logo back. Now there's other attributes that we can and probably should use with an image. So one is title. Now we've seen the title attribute before. Now remember the title text that we provide here in the title attribute is not accessible. A screen reader will not read it. So this can't be something that is very important that everybody should know. This is text that can complement our image, but it's not necessarily uh, required. The page is complete without it, but we can add some complementary text here. So I'll just put I am learning HTML5. It doesn't have to be, well, I don't even need the period really. It doesn't have to be identical to the alt text at all. This should be complementary. But now if we mouse over the image, we'll see the title pop up that says I am learning HTML5, and that's complementary. A couple of other attributes that way back in the 1990s, these were required. However, for years, these have not been required, but now they're coming back and it's width, and height. So if we define a width here and we want to provide the same width of our image. Now I saved this image with a file name that tells me or reminds me exactly the width and the height and it's 300 pixels by 300 pixels. So I'll just put 300. If we just provide the width, HTML will remember or shift the image to match so the aspect ratio stays the same. So if I switch this to 200 and save, notice it also adjusted the height of the image. However, we want to provide both. We want to provide the width and the height and let's provide exactly what they are. And I'll tell you why this is making a comeback and why it is now recommended to provide the width and the height, even though we can change this in the future with CSS. So I'm saying we provide these, but yes, CSS may change and override these values. So why do we provide them? Well, it's a little complicated, but it's called cumulative layout shift. If you've ever gone to a web page and you were getting ready to click on something and then you saw the page shift around, maybe a pop-up ad appeared or a banner ad and you clicked on something that you didn't intend to click because the button or the image that you wanted to click suddenly moved, that is cumulative layout shift. So we provide the width and the height now to tell the browser, hey, this is going to take up some space here and this is how much. If we don't provide that, the browser shifts everything once it figures out the size of the image. Now once again, you can still change the size of the image, make it responsive, which would adapt to mobile devices and everything else with CSS. So we really provide this information with the width and the height just to give the browser an idea of the size and the aspect ratio coming in so it just kind of prepares itself and that helps just a little bit. It is now recommended by Google developers that we do provide the width and the height in the image element. With our first image added, now let's scroll down and add a second image to our page and we'll scroll down to our vacation area, place I'd like to visit. Let's change this to places I'd like to visit and They've got, I've heard good things about the Caribbean. So this seems like a great place to put an image of a Caribbean beach. So once again, we'll type our IMG abbreviation and press tab. And then Visual Studio Code helps us out by providing the image element with the source and alt attributes ready to go. So for the source, once again, type the name of our folder, press slash, and now we get the names of the images we have ready. I'm going to choose Caribbean. And then in the alt area, I'm going to type Caribbean Beach. And now let's save and see what we get on the page when we scroll down, because we have to scroll down a little ways to see it. And there is our Caribbean Beach image. So now let's add a title attribute that's just a little different than our alt attribute, just complementary text. And this is, I want to visit a Caribbean Beach. And we'll save that. 
Now we're getting closer, but remember we should apply the width and the height attributes as well. So let's click on the file explorer because I didn't have the width and the height saved in the name of this JPEG file, .jpg. Notice the other image we used was a .png. There are different image file types and those have different extensions. So now I'll click the explore up here. I'll go back, open the image folder and I'm going to click on the Caribbean image. Now when I do that in Visual Studio Code, it shows the image and at the bottom I can see it is 400 pixels by 225. The first number is the width. So I'm going to close this now, click File Explorer to hide that so I have a little more room and now I can say width equals 400 and the height equals 225. And if we save, everything should remain the same. We've just provided these extra attributes. Now I've noticed that uh, this wrapped a little strange here in Visual Studio Code, but know that the width and the height are still part of the image element that we started right here. Okay, now that we've got that, let's go ahead and remove the in from the JPEG so it will not find the image and make sure our alt text appears. Yes, we've got a broken image icon, but it says Caribbean Beach, and that is our alt text. So I'll fix that by putting the in back in the name, spelling it correctly, and the image shows up because now Visual Studio Code can find the file for us. Okay, we had to scroll down to see this image because our page is long enough that if we scroll to the top, we don't see our vacation area anymore. Now, this bottom of the page here, you could call it a crease if it was a newspaper and a lot of the terminology kind of goes back to newspapers and magazines as we talk about layout. And so this bottom part that uh, defines the line that uh, anything below that we do not see right now, that's called the fold. So anything uh, after this area that we can now see is called below the fold. So anything below the fold we have to scroll to see. And now we scroll to see this image. Well there's one more attribute for this image that I want to talk about and it's the loading attribute. And if we provide loading and we can set it equal to a value and there's two possible values. The first one is eager but we never have to provide this. This is the value by default. So if we do not provide the loading attribute, the loading attribute is always there and it's just set to eager. We just don't see it. But the one that we do need to provide is called lazy. And what you want to do for performance for your web page is for any image that is below the fold, that is one you do not currently see when the page loads, you want to set the loading attribute to lazy. And that means the browser will only load that image when it knows it is about to show it when we start to scroll. Now Firefox, the web browser Firefox, is much easier to demonstrate this in. Chrome wants to display the image much earlier. So it, right now this image is close enough to the area that we see that it will still load this Caribbean image automatically that we have here. So I need to create some extra space and I can demonstrate this to you by using something called Chrome DevTools that's available in the browser. So let's do that now. I'm going to scroll back up above places I'd like to visit to the HR area the horizontal rule that we have going across right here before the I am also planning a vacation. And I'll type an abbreviation BR for a line break and then I'll put the asterisk for times and I'm going to put 150. This Emmet abbreviation that Visual Studio Code supports will insert 150 line breaks into our page. There's no way I would want to type all of those individually, but I can do it with this abbreviation. So I'll click that and suddenly we have all of these line breaks. If I save, now we don't see this change, but now there's a lot of space between the sections and that's what I need to demonstrate this. So we've changed the code. I'm going to click the maximize button here in Chrome to bring the browser all the way out. And now let's right click and choose inspect. And you could also do this with keys and it would be control, shift, and the letter I all at once. The control key, the shift key, and the letter I. I'm just going to right click and choose inspect. Either way, we'll open up the DevTools in Chrome. And now that we're getting the DevTools open, 
it will automatically open to the Elements tab. And notice how if I hover over an area in the Elements, now it highlights those on the left in the browser. So here I've hovered over my goals for the year and we can see that. I can hover over the section that discusses HTML and it highlights that section. What we want to do though is click the two greater than symbols here at the top and I'm going to choose the Network tab. Once it shows the Network tab, you'll want your Disable Cache to have the check mark. And that is because browsers know to save images after they've loaded them initially so they can reload them fast. But that is called the cache where it stores the images, that's C-A-C-H-E. We want to disable that cache so we can demonstrate this. Also, in this area right below the filters, you see all fetch slash XHR, JS, CSS. Choose the image. All we are interested in right now are the image files. We don't want to see the rest of the files. So once you've done all of that, we're going to go ahead and reload the page. So I'm going to click the reload icon up here in the browser and we've reloaded. And notice down here, we just see the HTML logo file. That's all that has loaded right now. And now as we scroll down, as we get close to the Caribbean image file, we will see it load because it has the loading attribute set to lazy. So only once we get close, and I created a lot of space here, so I'm scrolling down and fairly soon it should pop up. There it is. We don't see it on the page yet over here, but it's getting close. So Chrome loaded it in preparation for us to see it. But what that really helps is that it did not load the image right when we loaded our page. So that made our page load faster. It only loads these images when it thinks it's going to need them. And that is lazy loading. So now you can click the X here in the top right to close the dev tools. Then I'm going to click the maximize button again to get the browser back to the size we wanted it. I'll drag it down here so we can see everything. And then over in Visual Studio Code, I'm going to press Control Z, which is undo. You could also go to the edit menu and choose undo, but I'll do Control Z and get rid of all those line breaks. But again, if you want to demonstrate that, you can just type in BR and then how many of those elements you want and Visual Studio Code will recognize that. So that is a demonstration of a lazy loading technique that helps your pages load faster. Imagine if you had a page that had a dozen or 20 or even 50 images, you wouldn't want the page to continue loading until it loaded all of those images. So lazy loading is a very good performance technique, especially when you're dealing with lots of images that are below the fold. Now let's add a new element to our page, and it's something we're going to wrap this image in. So I'll put it underneath the paragraph that says I've heard good things about the Caribbean, and I'm going to type the word figure, and I'll press tab because figure is an element. Now I'll highlight the closing tag and press Control X to cut. You can also get these options that I use with the keyboard shortcuts in the edit menu. There's cut, copy, and paste. So it's Control X to cut, and now at the end of the image here, I'm going to paste, which is Control V, and now I've got the opening and closing figure tags. I'll highlight the image here and just tab it in as I'm used to seeing it. So the image is inside the figure element. Now this by itself won't do much, but it is saying we've got a figure with an image and we can add a caption and it tells the browser that the caption, big caption element, is related to the image, which is better than just putting a paragraph underneath it. The paragraph while we could visually see it's probably related to the image if it was right under the image, it's not telling the browser or assistive technology that it is a caption for the image. This spells it out for both the browser and assistive technology that yes, what we put in here is directly related to this image, but it doesn't have to be identical to the alt attribute of the image, although it should kind of be a description of the image. So I'll put Caribbean Beach getaway here as our fig caption. And now it does show up on the page and notice the image has been indented just a little bit. And once again, we can change all of the layout of the page and how everything looks with CSS in the future. But this is just the 
uh, default behavior when we apply a figure. It's indented somewhat. So we have an image and the caption now. Let's go ahead and add our last image as well. And we wanna put that underneath Margarita Island Reserve Riviera Cancun, an actual resort in the Mexican uh, Riviera Cancun area. So we'll scroll down here and underneath the address, we wanna add an image of at least the uh, Cancun area because that's where we're thinking about going. So image and we press the tab button and we get the source and alt attribute again. So let's type IMG, that's the name of our folder, and slash. And now we've got our vacation image, and that looks good. And now we can put in the alt tag, the Cancun vacation for our vacation image. And now in the title, we can put something like, it's five o'clock somewhere because that's kind of related to Margaritaville and Jimmy Buffett and he's famous for that saying and it's five o'clock somewhere. There's something worth noting about this phrase. We've got single quotations here inside of our double quotations. Now that's what's possible. If we had used single quotes out here, this would not be possible, but we can use single quotes inside of our double quotes. So this does work. Now let's go ahead and save. And if we look at the page, right underneath the address for the resort we're thinking about, we've got our Caribbean vacation image. And if we mouse over, we've got the title, it's five o'clock somewhere. That looks good. But notice we don't have the space or the indentation that we get from the figure element. So let's go ahead and put a figure element around this image as well. So we'll type figure press tab. Once again, I'm going to highlight the closing tag, press control X underneath the image, control V to paste it in. And if I save, I should get some auto formatting. And so now I've got the image indented inside the figure. And let's add a caption here as well. Remember, it's the fig caption element. So I'll press tab. And now let's put a Caribbean vacation image. So it's not quite the same as our alt attribute, it's not the same as our title attribute, but it's a nice description of this image. Okay, we're not quite finished with our image. It's easy to forget some of these attributes that we might not think about applying right away. So one we know we need is the loading because this will absolutely be below the fold. So let's set that to lazy as well and save. And now let's click on the file explorer again in the top left and let's look at our vacation image and find the dimensions. And we can see here at the bottom, it's 400 pixels by 267 pixels. So now we can close that out and click on the file explorer to hide that again. And let's provide width and height. So the width is equal to 400 and the height is equal to 267. So now we've provided all the correct attributes that we need for this image, and everything looks good here on the page. One more thing I want to add about figure. Figure is not just for images. So let's scroll up here in VS Code back to our HTML area, and we do have our HTML logo right here underneath. This is my first web page. We'll scroll back up to this area here on the page as well. And now we can add a figure underneath this image. So I'll type the word figure again. And now let's add a fig caption first. The fig caption element needs to either be the first thing inside of a figure or the last thing. It can be either or. So here I'm going to type in example of HTML5 code, and that will be our caption. So let's save that much, and we see that here, but really we have no content inside of our figure yet. So let's go ahead and add some content, and I'll add a paragraph, which is a block level element. We've discussed that in the past, block versus inline. And now for the text of the paragraph, I wanna put that inside of an inline element that will not create a line break. And it's a code element. Code 
this element code helps you actually display code if that's what you want to use. You can use other elements inside of it though. So if I want to display HTML code, I can't simply put an H1 element because then it applies this element to the page. We need to go back to what we learned about HTML entities to provide the less than sign, which is an ampersand LT with a semicolon. Then I could type H1 and then ampersand GT with a semicolon for the greater than symbol. And now I'll put hello world with an exclamation mark. And then I'll do the less than HTML entity again and then a slash H1 and then the ampersand GT semicolon, which is greater than and a semicolon. And now if we look at the page, we have got an example of some HTML code printed directly to our web page. So this is another example of how to use a figure element. It can contain other content such as a code sample and you can have a caption at the top just as easily as you can at the bottom of the figure. Okay, our code for the lesson is complete, but I do want to show you some image resources. But before we can do that, we need to validate our code with the validator once again. So I'm going to grab this and make it just a little wider so the validator shows up better here. Remember, we're at validator.w3.org. We want to click Validate by File Upload. Click Choose File. Make sure you're in the correct folder once this folder area opens up and I'm in the lesson six folder. And then I'm going to choose the index file that we were working in and choose open. And from there I can choose check. And it should check the HTML. It says document checking completed, no errors or warnings to show. That's what you want. If you do get an error or warning, it should tell you what line it's on in your code and you can refer to Visual Studio Code find the line and fix the error that it is telling you about. So once again, validate your code before you finish. Before finishing this image lesson, I wanted to share some resources that I use. Now there are many resources out there, so these are just a few, and I'm sure you can find others as well. First, there's this article that has 21 of the best placeholder image generators. Using placeholder images is very common practice when you're laying out a page and you're not sure the images you want to use yet. What you can do is take a URL like this from placeholder.com and put it in as the value of the source attribute in your HTML image tag and then it will generate a placeholder image until you find the image you want to put there. Some of these other image generators actually provide pictures, like the second one on the list called Phil Murray provides random pictures of the actor Bill Murray, but it works in the same way. You put the URL in for the source attribute value in your image tag, and then you will get a picture of Bill Murray from this image generator. Okay, the next several sites are just great places to download freely uh, usable images, as it says right here. Uh, these are licensed for free use. It's important to download and use images that you actually have the usage rights to. So this is a good way to do that. Find them on unsplash.com is my favorite. You can also go to pexels.com, as you see here, very similar site. You can also go to gratisography.com. And this site has unique and kind of funny pictures. So that's kind of neat too. And you never know what you'll see on these. The next one is pixabay.com. Very much like the previous ones I showed you. From there, I want to suggest some free image software. It's called Urfan View. I've used this for years. It's just really lightweight software, easy to use and you can load in an image and resize it. And that's what I usually use it for. You can also crop images with it. I'll pull it over here as I have an instance of Earth and View open already. You can see I've got in this large picture of the Caribbean beach, but you can go to the edit menu and you can see different options that are here, such as the crop. And of course we'd have to select an area to do it. But in the image menu, there is a resize resample and here you can see you've got the dimensions of the image, but I can resize this. It's a huge image right now at 5,464 pixels wide. I'll take it to say 400 pixels 
and it stays in sync, so it keeps the aspect ratio. And now we're at 225 for the height. So you see the current size and then the new size. I'll click OK, and it brings it down to a much smaller, nicer size. Easy to save as well as a new name and a great little software to use. From there, I also recommend Canva.com. Now, disclosure here, there is a paid subscription to use this site. However, I believe they have a free account that you can at least get some of the features or try it out. So canva.com is good. After you've got your images, and even after you have resized your images to the smaller size that you would probably use on your web page, it's also a good idea to drag and drop them into tinypng.com. I believe this also comes up if you type in tinyjpg.com, but it will compress the images and they will still look good, but they get a smaller file size, so they load to that web page faster, which is always important. So all of these resources are great, and I will put links to all of them in the description below. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection, and a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you, and thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.